Hello and you're very welcome to another edition of the JMAC Podcast. I'm John Mann and of course this podcast is sponsored by YorgoRetro.com. Check out the website for all your retro gear needs and wants. And today I'm joined by Danny Hughes just to discuss, I suppose, any recent GA events. So obviously in recent weeks we've seen uh, Monin and uh, Dublin kind of breaking the COVID rules and uh, we've got a All-Ireland roadmap as well. So the All-Ireland is going to be taking take place in August. So good excitement, but unfortunately the club uh, up here in the South is uh, no real direction. But Danny's delighted. It's all happening in the north tonight, so he's going to be uh, training his uh, new club team, Castle Wellen. But before we start all that, Danny Hughes, I'm a good man. How are you? Good, thanks, John. How are you? Good. Uh, thank God, I'm, I'm all good. And uh, as I was referencing there, um, uh, there's a bit of white smoke. Danny Hughes is the new Castle Wellen manager. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm actually yeah. Well, I suppose from a playing perspective, um. 39 years young and uh, I'm um, I've decided that that it's time now that uh, I quit football um, so this is listen it's a brilliant opportunity for me to go in and I suppose t- test my uh, test my managerial legs and uh, I'm really looking forward to it. it's a big big club here and down and a uh, great bunch of lads so far so you know it has been looking forward to just meeting them all and because it's always been operating remotely at through Zoom and through um, WhatsApp and stuff, you know, when you're talking about organising training sessions. So it has, um, yeah, it's been challenging, no doubt about it. It's been very difficult, but the boys have been brilliant. I have to say, uh, I suppose when any new management team comes in, it's, it's a bit of a bounce, but I'm very lucky to have a guy, Gavin, training with me, and Gavin's a up-and-coming uh, coach, and he's been phenomenal, you know. So, you know, the boys have been brilliant too, so I'm just looking forward to getting stuck in. Yeah, brilliant. And I suppose the the, uh, ch- the podcast we done a few weeks ago. Did I retire? Did I retire, Danny? Or like, did, was that like the final nail? In the oh no, that was fine. That was fine. <laughs> you never put the final nail in. The final nail was done long ago by my wife. <laughs> my wife put the final nail in the coffin. You know, so don't, don't worry, John. <laughs> I tell me this, Danny. Um, so you're only joined up. So was there any kind of were you sending the boys runs or any of that kind of crack or what? what yeah, what's been yeah. Uh, yeah. It was I, to be honest. I'm, I I keep saying to the boys and I keep saying to my own management team that uh, I'm I'm just a figurehead. I really don't have a huge amount to add. It's Gavin Trainer, the trainer. Um, so um, and Gavin has done all the pre- preparatory work and the boys have been phenomenal, uh, really phenomenal, and a great bunch of lads. They, they, they do um, seem to be very enthusiastic for the year going ahead and, you know, I suppose with um, ideas of how, how we want to play and how we want to set up and what our goals are for the year. So I'm just looking forward to getting stuck into it, John, do you know, and I just think with this whole COVID, it's been so nonsensical having outdoor training and in the South, particularly, it continues to be uh, a very very difficult period for for GA clubs and all sporting clubs, rugby, soccer, whatever. You know, it's just the government have been so inept. Um, they haven't they haven't measured the value of society at the minute and where they are at. And I think it's got to the stage where people are just sick and tired of it and sick and tired of the government as well. So if there was an election in the morning, you certainly wouldn't be you wouldn't be putting your house on the fact that that coalition government down there will be returned. You know, certainly wouldn't think so anyway. Yeah, definitely not. Definitely not. I agree with all that. And so we wish you all the best with Castle Well and I hope everything goes well and training goes well tonight. And I suppose Danny, we can we can we can touch what touch on what I was saying at the very start. So we can touch on the the mighty dubs, the all conquering dubs. Um if, if the news broke on the first of April, I woke up had a few beers the night before. Um I think I was I was um just having a, having a few relaxing beers. I woke up uh, April Fool's Day. And it was in front of the Irish Independent. Danny Hughes, uh, explain what the crack was there. Well, I, was, I think I've alluded to this before. Do I think it's front page news? Probably not. Um, I think it's historical. Um, again, it's a bit like the culture now, where it's the council culture. Um, it's, it's not front page news, certainly not. Um, the fact that Dublin were, were called training, I suppose, in my head, there was a coach there at the training session, so it looks it looks it looks organised in nature, um, and I suppose maybe Dublin and Desi Farrell felt the pressure that possibly other teams were training, so they needed to train. Um, I I don't feel that Dublin needed to train. I think Dublin could uh, go another twelve weeks without really doing a huge amount, and they could still be the best team in the country. But um, I suppose from from my perspective. 
I think the the rules have been a nonsense, um, and I feel that counties have inevitably uh, taken matters into their own hands, and most counties trained in in some aspect. Now, collectively, I'm not so sure, but certainly in in pods and groups, uh, county teams have been training, and uh, I I don't blame them one bit. And uh, you even look at uh, you even look at Down and and, and uh, Down and Cork got caught, happened to get caught earlier on, and you know, in other forms of society, you would have to say that politicians haven't been uh, similarly um, banned from their workplaces and stuff. So I think we have to put it in perspective. Yes, they were training, but you know, it was unlikely that COVID would have been spread at any point during that training sessions, and. Players know themselves; they wouldn't have been going infected with COVID if if they were say, showing any symptoms. So this is a case where, you know, it's just unfortunate that the rules were there and Dublin happened to get caught. But it was a surprise Daisy Far? I was surprised Daisy Far was caught, to be honest, because he's former head GPO or GPA CEO. Um, he, he works within the health system, um, and you know he knew that the spotlight would be in Dublin, so. You know, there was always a chance that somebody would would pick that up. So I was a bit surprised that he took the chance. Yeah, definitely, without really doubt. And like, it's probably all hearsay, but I like apparently I heard now. I think the reason and how Dublin were caught is because their sponsor cars were uh, seen, and um, I think someone like caught a glimpse of that. And geez, the must have just got wind from it and got the pictures and all. So it just goes to show, Danny, um, make one mistake and you're you're fit. Yeah, and I suppose it's it's with social media there, with smartphones, with thing you're never off duty as a as a player, an inter county player. You're I suppose you're you're judged alongside the the professional rugby players, the professional soccer players, um, and obviously you don't have have any of the financial benefits that they do. Uh, however, in Dublin, you sort of have you sort of have that sponsored car element and the fact that there is there's perception out there that Dublin are uh, are treated a whole lot better than most uh, county players, which is a fact. Let's be let's be honest. If they're if they're sp- if sponsored cars and stuff like that, if they are they are the elite. They are the the uh, they are on that perch, and I suppose um, they're they're to be knocked. And the press take great delight in doing that in a lot of cases, and uh, that goes right throughout society. So, um, you know, it's not it's not surprising to me that a lot of county teams have been called training and you know it's like that it's a bit like the april only ban that they took in as well you know these these things tend not to work in a lot of cases yeah i suppose like, like i think everyone the, the first thing that came into everyone's mind the professionalism doesn't bring to the table danny the six all irons in a row the players everything comes with it, the money that's been pumped in so for the dubs to be caught of all counties it uh, it was very surprising, I suppose, Danny. Yeah, well, I suppose Dublin could go to, and as I said to you, Dublin could go in all twelve weeks of just resting, and they could still come back and win the All Ireland and win the Leinster Championship without even uh, collectively training, uh, mm-hmm. just just playing out matches. Dublin would still win them. That's how far they are ahead. So I suppose, as I said, I was surprised that they took the chance on it. Do I blame them? No, not really. I, 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 as I said, I'm not into the hysterics of it. I don't really blame them for doing what they did because I think that the the laws are nonsense, the current restrictions are nonsense, and I feel that the government and the association as well have the GA when the you know in the first lockdown you know they provided a great deal of support to many people and stuff, but I think they're towing the line to a stage now where it's a bit it's a bit sycophantic uh, from from my perspective. You know, maybe they're looking for additional funding. Maybe they have to toe the line with the government. But you know, when you have an invested uh, huge amount of members throughout the society, when you have um, rates of infection uh, dropping so significantly in this last few weeks, when you have no uh, no evidence that outdoor transmission is is a significant factor in, in spreading the the coronavirus, then you know, on the back of that decision, you would. You would like to think, John, that the government would would be sensible and use common sense. So it doesn't it doesn't seem to be the case. Oh, my two week girls just right girls. I'm on a podcast here, so 
Say bye bye. <laughs> Say bye bye to Jeff. <laughs> You're picking out your vitamin pills. Say bye bye. <laughs> right, way down the moment. Quick. Go. Go. No. Bye. <laughs> there you go. Bye bye, girls. See ya. Bye. Bye. Jeez, I tell you what, Dan, you wouldn't, wouldn't want to be caught training with them two girls. Jeez, they keep it that close. Way, <laughs> uh, no, that's all good stuff, Danny. And I suppose, obviously, um, a couple of weeks, like what, a week later, two weeks later, um, uh, Monaghan were caught training as well. Uh, Banty, unfortunately, was got the bare brunt of it. And, you know, what was the verdict in that, uh, Danny? Like, surely they could have learned from Dublin's mistake? Well, you would have thought so. Like, you know, when... I suppose when Dublin were caught, <laughs> you would think that most our county teams would be saying to themselves, we've got to be very, very careful here. We've got to knock on the head for a couple of weeks. You know, for Munland to turn around and be caught just seems, oh, just seems a bit of a own goal from their perspective. But again, was there an outcry as in, you know, would, would uh, if during the first lockdown there could have been a out, bit of an outcry within society given the seriousness of it and stuff like that. At this stage, I don't feel that the the feeling within society and within communities is is to an extent where, you know, Monaghan and Dublin's reputation are going to suffer immeasurably. I, I don't believe that that's going to be the case because I think a lot of people have become so sick and tired during this lockdown that, they feel that they too, if everybody was to be judged on adhering to the rules, possibly nobody would, would have adhered to it, if you know what I mean. So, you know, I, yeah, it was one of those things that was just unfortunate for the counties involved. But, you know, I suppose maybe the other counties that are trained at the minute are lucky not to have been caught. But it's, it's all very, it's all very subjective. I, I don't, I'm I'm not that hysterical about it, and um, because I just feel that, you know, they they haven't been caught, other counties haven't been caught, and I think it's a nonsense anyway. Yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. And I suppose I suppose one thing you can maybe look at it, you were talking about reputation, like an old Banty came in and took the job again, and you probably just want to be working hard, and keeping the head down. I know a lot of people, a lot of people have varied opinions on uh, Banty McEnany and like it's just the way life is. But you know, how does that do his reputation, Danny? Like I suppose you know he didn't want to come back and make an impression. I suppose I I've great time for Banty. I really do. Um, I've great time for him. He was always um, I I he, he helped out Joe Kiernan with the Railway Cup teams, and I found him to be very, very honest, very uh, very much a players man. Really good fella. Yeah. Um, so my own my own feeling on Bondi um, hasn't hasn't been. It certainly hasn't changed on the back of uh, on the back of uh, of, uh, of uh, COVID on the back of um, them not adhering to the the restrictions. Um, Monaghan are in a very different space as regards to uh, the All Ireland and competing. I suppose they've they've been to Ulster Championships. They've won Ulster titles. In this last decade, so that that they've created this expectation there to now go on and win an All Ireland. Can they do it? Do they have the depth? And this is the big question. Um, regardless or not of Bonte, the question has to be asked. It, aside from Conor McManus, who's arguably one of the best footballers that Monaghan have ever produced, um, do Monaghan have the forward line there to compete? And I'm not sure if they do. Um, yes, they have good players, really good players there, but do they have enough to go on and win an All Ireland, which is extremely tough? You're talking about beating a Dublin team that's the greatest, one of the greatest teams um, uh, the J in the J hurling uh, on football. So you know, Monaghan are they have to be realistic about where they are. If Bonty can keep them competitive, if he can still deliver the All Ulster title, if they can still be there in the last eight. I think that's success. Um, geez, and down we would love to win an Ulster title um, and break that duck since 1984. So uh, it's about being competitive, I think, and people got to be realistic about where their own counties are. There's going to be one winner every year. Um, 
and 31 or 32 odd losers given London and New York's thing. So you got to be realistic. Monon got to be realistic. Monon supporters need to be realistic. Being beaten uh, last year by Calvin, who went on to win an off the title, would have hurt them very, very hard, especially the Monon in the defeat. Um, they, they were probably a wee bit arrogant uh, going into the game and uh, very complacent within the game. Um, so I think Bonte had his first year grace there, but you know certainly he'll be under a bit of pressure from within his own camp, not from its out, uh, outside. Because Monaghan have always kind of they've punched well above you know their weight. So I think it's from within that Bonte will will be getting the pressure. Um, but he can he can certainly produce he can certainly produce good good uh, performances from the Monaghan team. Um, but it's always a bit like, you know, when you were younger, uh, going back out with the same girl again. Uh, you know, sometimes it's just not the best idea in the world because it wasn't as good the first time around. So, um, so Bobby, you know, he could well regret going back in there um, and only time will tell. But the pressure is going to be from within the squad and within the wider support network there and the, from the supporters. But if he had another year like last year in terms of the championship, certainly it's a knockout championship this year. So, you know, but I still think he'll get his three-year term. You know, yeah, definitely. And I suppose that's that's what I mean. You, you probably don't you don't go back to uh, you don't you don't go back to where you probably didn't have great kind of uh, success in the first place, Danny. So it's it, it, it definitely was a funny one with Banty coming back. But like, look, because he's. It is what it is, and I suppose like like the two counties getting caught, Danny. Like, is this kind of like was that a bit of a middle fingers up from maybe the Dublin kind of management team or the Dublin players to the government about the frustration um, of the restrictions at the minute, Danny? I um I don't think so, John. To be honest, I don't think there were. I think it it come down to very very simple, very simple reasons, uh, and the simple reasons for it were. That Dublin's on their perch. They are the team to beat. Um, they're six-time All Ireland champions now in a row. Brian Fenton's never been beaten the championship match. There's a different type of pressure that comes with that. There's a pressure to remain on top of their perch, to remain at that very, very top. Now, Daisy Ford won't want to destroy his own legacy by being the one to not deliver an All Ireland, not continue that run, winning run. He wants to be compared, I'm sure, even personally, wants to be compared with Jim Galvin as one of the best uh, managers ever in the game. So, you know, the players as well, Fenton will not want to be beat on, on Desi's watch or in any watch. If Brian Fenton went through his whole career without losing a championship match, that's a serious, serious record. Their players are picking up personal awards left, right and centre. If they continue to dominate like they are, the sponsored cars aren't going to be a problem. So there's a different pressure that comes with playing for Dublin now. And maybe perhaps they felt, if we don't do this, we're going to be knocked off our perch. And listen, it could happen. Kerry could come along. Tyrone could come along strong. So you're as good as your last game. And the pressures now are no different than in professional sport. The professional, uh, the, the preparation that it takes to get a team such as Dublin ready if, if those standards start to split, um, if those standards are slipping week in, week out, or there isn't that heavy, uh, there isn't that heavy training uh, that's being done there and they come back less fit and less intense, then we have serious, serious problems if I was a Dublin player or Dublin management team in getting people right for Leinster and for an All-Ireland um, uh, run. So, listen, I think it was a case that that Dublin had to, or the felt that they had to, um, keep up with the Joneses, uh, when really Dublin could go, and as I said, uh, 12 weeks without training, turn up at a Leinster Championship match and arguably still win Leinster. So, um, yeah, they, they're, they're trying to keep up, um, trying to do what every other county is doing, but aren't getting caught. So uh, I don't think there was any disrespect meant towards the uh, the wider society, uh, the association or the government. I think it was just a case where they, they wanted to get back onto the field. And John, let's be honest, who doesn't down south? Who doesn't in the north want to get back onto the field to start playing football? Um, so, you know, you have to you have to look at it in, within that context in my, in my brain and in, in my head. 
Yeah, definitely, without a doubt. I suppose, like, what, what can you have you made of, like, the 12-week bands? Like, do you feel, like, obviously, I don't know, you probably don't get much of a feel about the whole kind of thing with COVID, but, but what did you make, of, say, the band for Banty and uh, Desi Farrell, 12 weeks, Danny, or I know so, a lot of people saying, oh, Jesus, will, will the players get banned? What will happen to them, the ones who were training? <laughs> so what have you made of all that, Danny? Well, you know, a 12-week bond, for a manager, a 12-week bond is the 12 week bond from all G activities, a 12 week bond from the field. You know, the, the manager will still be able to control and organize and do all that. Yeah. You know, have, have 12 week bonds. You know, has Michal Martin been banned for breaking protocol for 12 weeks from his job? Um, and the answer to that is all no. So I'm, I'm not sure what the bonds, I'm not sure how effective the bonds are. Or the mean is it? It's it's all symbolic in in my head. It's all symbolic of you know banning somebody for the sake of banning somebody. You know, or being seen to do the right thing. Or here's your slap on the wrist. But it's 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 symbolic more than it is having any on the ground kind of uh, effect on Dublin's preparations or Monaghan's preparations. Famously, you know. Jose Mourinho was banned when he was Chelsea manager and seemed to um, uh, figure out a way to get into the changing rooms via the laundry basket. So again, you know, maybe, you know, in this day and age with social media, with communications and stuff like that, you know, I think Dublin players could nearly run their own training sessions, run their own um, uh, team regardless of where, where Desi's there or not. So yeah. it's a symbolic thing. It's, it does no real true meaning. Yeah, like it, it, and it probably does it does feel like nonsense because obviously Banty is a right-hand man, Desi Farrell is a right-hand man, man, Dublin have about 798 people in their backroom team. So like, that, you know, it is it is very wish-wash, Danny. So, you know, what nearly was the point? Could something more effective be done, Danny, or was it just, you know, hearsay, really? Well, it was funny, and social media was lit up with the fact that Dublin were banned, but they were going to have to play their home matches uh, outside Parnell Park and Croke Park. Um, so I thought that was ironic and quite funny. Um, you know, if there had been points deduction, obviously, uh, that would have been obviously uh, far, far tougher on counties. Um, if there had been... Uh, the points deduction if there had been individual players banned again, again how do you how do you how do you measure that in, in terms of effectiveness on a county team like if if you had five or six Dublin players that were involved in that training sessions banned from three or four games that would have a really big effect on uh, on, on the conditions where Dublin would be going into a league or the championship so you would you would think that those type of things would deter other counties, um, and that precedent would have been set with down in Cork. But at the end of the day, that never happened. It was a ban. Um, it was a ban on a on a, on a county on a county management team that I think is, as I said, symbolic. And you know, if we're talking about financial slaps on the wrist, Dublin could take that all day long. Dub down not as much. Cork could probably take it. And Monning could also take it. They would probably find some way uh, to to meet that with without any issue. So uh, you know, GA Bannon managers is a again it comes into the into the what effect? What's the point? You know? Yeah, like uh, it, it just does seem ridiculous. Like they sit that out. And, like I, I see you see some of the Dublin lads just sharing stuff on Instagram. Back to life, normality, having the crack. So it's just. I don't really want. I didn't. I don't know really what to make of it all, Danny. Because it's probably a bit of a funny setup, but I suppose that's that. And I suppose we we got a bit of a roadmap. The All Ireland Final is going to be play, taking place in August, nice and early, Danny. Um, and look, look, it's it's great news, a bit of uplifting news. I suppose down here in the south, you need something to uh, kind of clutch on to. And I suppose what was the verdict and all that, Danny? What what have you made the, made um, the roadmap? Cert certainly, I, I felt it was a bit of a surprise that they would go to a straight knockout again. Uh, I felt that. There might have been there might have been an appetite there to try and get a couple of qualifier games in. Um, I think the fact that the leagues now, um, I think they're going to go into the leagues. They they won round uh, games with the north section, the south section, etc. But I'm not sure how that. Um, I'm I'm not sure how how. <laughs> 
how smart that is either because when you look at down i think down are in my mail uh westmeath and somebody else but and, and to me that doesn't feel like a northern section of the league um so i'm, I'm not sure how sensible that was in my head it would have been better for the ga just to give the clubs back control of the first half of the year and then in the latter half of the year when significantly more people were vaccinated to go and play their league and championship week after week which can be done um you can play on multiple championship matches in any given day and do like a highlights program not on like match of the day and sunday game and stuff like that that can be done and logistically tv companies sky and rt could could obviously control the rights to that but they could share games and stuff like that you know um so i don't really understand the GA continued insistence on putting into county football um, first. I just, I just beg his belief why why they're they're sticking to that. The fact are that the GA is there's going to be a massive hole in their in their coffers as well. So you would sort of think that they would want some income during the year in 2021 to try and um, to try and I suppose regain some financial uh, reward for putting on the championships, but. Uh, the logic behind putting it on now, I suppose, is I, I missed, you know. Yeah, definitely wrote it down. I suppose a lot of people can in recent weeks and days have kind of been saying like the elite status and they've got the, the GA, they've got it back now and why get rid, rid, rid of it in the first place, Danny? And at the start, I couldn't understand it and now it's just been regained all of a sudden. Um, you wouldn't want to think too much about it all, Danny. It would, it would really fry your head, I suppose. I, I, you know, the fault for that lay in my head at John Horn's door. Not Larry McCarthy's to be fair. He came in in the midst of a banana week and he's only just into the job. But then the fault lies with John Horn simply, pure and simply, on, on the on the guys that are running the operation down in Cook Park. Simply put, that Jay should never have lost his elite status. And the fact that it was, when you when you look at a championship match of tw- verbally an average championship match of 15 to 20,000 turn up at the game and it's not deemed elite. Um, and you have a soccer uh, League of Ireland game, uh, and you have uh, two men and a dog at it, you know. So, uh, I, I really don't, uh, and that's not being disparaging towards uh, League of Ireland soccer, um, but you know, the, invariably, the GAA has is our national game, it's our national sport, and I think it's even a bit of a kick in the stomach when we feel that we train like professional athletes, the preparations are akin to anything you'd see in the Premier League in, in England um, and the international rugby, yet we're not elite. You know, it just it just stank for me. And, uh, you know, I took great umbrage with that, the, the fact that the GAA award fault for not renewing it. But I think it suited John Horn possibly when he was putting his hand out to maybe get some funds in for the GAA. There was obviously a commercial monetary uh, aspect to it. And I suspect... Um, that that had more to do with it than than uh, than looking to the members and looking to things that would lift our society, and I feel that it would have given us a great lift to have started back juvenile underage football, adult football, um, a month and a half or two months ago, uh, when when it could have been done safely. So, you know, I I, I suppose I feel a bit embittered towards um, the GAs. Um, lead on this and the fact that they just allowed the uh, the government to dictate terms on this and uh, in, in a lot of cases in my case politically i don't affiliate with a with a lot of parties out there because i find myself a bit at odds with strategy and, and where they're going the ga is i consider myself a member of the ga and i would align myself to their thinking more than anything politically um uh, so, you know, you would like your voice to be heard from a sporting organisation to the government, and I just feel that that has been lost. That has been lost um, under under John Horne's leadership, and I feel that Larry McCarthy's first few comments about getting juveniles back on the field were very welcome, and for me, that was a good start to his his presidency. You know. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose we were kind of talking off air, like, and obviously it's great that, you know, everything's coming back up in the north. It's, it's great to get, get back to training now at 12. So, but like, I think up here at the club, like, everyone's getting a bit frustrated with it, Danny, as well. And there's, there's still no room after the club. And like, if it wasn't the club, there'd be no county, Danny. So, 
you know, make make sense of that, I suppose. Yeah, well, I'm surprised that the the I'm surprised that the people in the south have taken this, um, the J or J membership have taken this just uh, lying down, so to speak. I think that uh, there hasn't been enough pushback to to the authorities, to um, the guys that's running things in Crow Park, who, in my opinion, have have missed. Uh, have missed the mood, have not gauged the mood of society of their own um, membership base well enough. Um, they've certainly not, they've not lobbied um, to to get us back into a situation where outdoor training can be permissible at inter-county level, juvenile level, adult level. There is no statistical evidence to say that coronavirus is spread in outdoor activity. If, it, if there is, it's minute or minimal. Um, so I can't for the life of me understand why the GA have just taken this um, uh, line down and why juveniles all over the country haven't been out on the fields. At the end of the day, last summer, all club football programmes were, were completed safely. And yes, it was unfortunate that there were championships and parties and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, we're not at that championship season. And by the time that comes around and later in the year, you know, hopefully society, a lot of society will be vaccinated at that point. So uh, I just, I just, the mind boggles when it comes to the guys that are um, making the law. And indeed, you know, when you look at some, but you just, as you say, you tear your hair out. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and I suppose there's probably more questions than answers. But Danny, I suppose look, at, we're really just looking forward to uh, the GA return in, in, in the next couple of weeks, and we're just buzzing to have it back, Danny. Yeah, definitely, and, and certainly I'm looking forward to it tonight, and uh, can't wait to just get back on the field and get. Uh, it's a massive thing. It's a massive football's about enjoying it, and I think the GA uh, during this whole lockdown, it is so important to all of us. The GA doesn't belong to the guys in Coke Park. It doesn't belong to the president. It doesn't belong to any one group. It belongs to us all. And that's the beauty about it. And we're all invested in it and we're all members of it. So uh, it's it's so important. It's more important now than it ever has been from a physical and mental perspective that people have that outlet, to have that social um, uh, outlet to go communicate with people, their neighbours, to have fun, mm-hmm. to get involved, to feel part of something much bigger than themselves. So I think that that importance, um, that important of, of, of the GA Parish community and football and hurling teams is is just phenomenal. Um, and uh, I just, it's the glue. It's the glue in, in our society and uh, it's never been more important that, that we use it now and we appreciate it a wee bit more. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with all that. Of course, Danny Hughes, thanks a million for joining me on the podcast this week. And of course, this podcast is sponsored by orgoretro.com. Check the website for all your retro care needs and wants. Danny, best luck for training tonight. I'm very, very jealous and uh, hope it all goes well for you. John, thanks, mate. Thanks very much. <laughs> Top, man. Thanks very much. Thanks, John.